Good morning and welcome to worship. Welcome to those of you who are here and welcome to those of you joining us online. Um, this is a very special day for a whole number of birthdays in the congregation. Um, Dory Evans is 90 years young today. Margot Eagleton, who I hope is joining us from home, is also 90 today. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, Liliana Sultana is 13 today. She becomes a teenager. So we don't have enough time to sing successive happy birthdays, but let's roll it all into one. And so a reminder, Dory, Margot, Liliana, say that after me. Dory, Margot, Liliano. Okay, maestro. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dory, Margot, Liliana. Happy birthday to you. Wonderful. And many more. Many more. Um, lastly, um, thank you for all the prayers that have come in over the last several weeks as beloved members of this congregation have lost family members. Um, I know that Bob would wish me to express his thanks on behalf of his family upon the death of Dr. Bob, and Jackie too, I'm sure, would want me to thank you for all of the prayers that wend her way on the death of her sister. It's wonderful to have both of you back in church, while well, all three of you, well, all four of you back in church. Welcome home. Michael, do you have any announcements that I'm not aware of that you would like to share with everyone? So see Michael or see Connections. By this time, everyone should be seeing Connections, hopefully. If, if you don't, make sure we have your email address so you will. And if you should be receiving it and are not, don't sit quietly uh, fuming over it. Let us know so we can help troubleshoot with you because it's so vital at any time, but particularly while we're still going through COVID-19, it's really vital that you stay up to date with everything that's happening at church, because by George, things are happening at church. And the best way to tap into that is through our twice-weekly constant contact, email blast, electronic newsletter connections. Please, if you don't receive it already, reach out to me or the church office will make sure that you do. And now let's compose our hearts and our minds for worship.
Please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all creation. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. <clears throat> we turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through His death and resurrection, Christ has made us His own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading comes from Jonah, the third and fourth chapters. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I, while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, 
and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? The word of the Lord.
The second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, beginning with the first chapter, the 21st verse. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And now I do not know which I prefer. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I'm convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggles that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them to the vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again at noon and at about three o'clock, he did the same. At about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart 
be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So, as you know, Amy and I have been flying around a lot recently to family weddings, um, which means I've been watching more movies than normal, because on an aeroplane, what else are you going to do? And it's also a way of watching some fairly recent-ish movies. Um, I like murder mysteries, so I remember this last flight. On the way there, I watched Murder on the Orient Express, that relatively recent remake uh, directed by and starring Kenneth Branagh with an all-star cast. And then on the way back, I watched Knives Out with the incredible Christopher Plummer in the lead and also a star-studded cast. And the thing I like about murder mysteries, um, almost universally, except with Columbo, is that you never know who did it until the end. If you remember the thing about Columbo, you always knew who did it right at the start, and then the whole show was about him proving who it was. But normally a murder mystery, you've got to try and guess as it goes along. Once in a while I get lucky, once in a while I figure it out, before the last five minutes, but most times it's pretty close to the end before we have a, a good idea of who did it, and then you often don't know until the very last scene. In fact, in some modern movies, you don't even know by the end of the credits rolling, but that's one of my personal little gripes. We can talk about that later after worship. So, so why mention all of that other than to share the name of two really good movies that if you haven't seen them, go watch them. Knives Out and the remake of Murder on the Orient Express. Well, I mention all that because this text, the gospel text in Matthew, is incredibly, incredibly familiar. We all know it like the back of our hands. The trouble with that text is that by now we've pretty much decided, you and I and all the scholars and the academy, we've all pretty much figured out what it means. And please don't tell me there's any other way of working it. You know, it's, it's almost like the opening 20 minutes of the movie and we say, no, nope, no, nope, I've got it. And our interpretation has historically run something like this. So, the first folks hired are our Jewish sisters and brothers um, who have been in that relationship with God for so long, since the time of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then us Christians come along at the end, and we're loved too. And they grumble about it, but we're the good guys in the story, and Jesus loves us, even though we're kind of Johnny-come-latelys. And with a little bit of finesse here and there, and the odd subplot, and one or two academic red herrings, that's kind of been the way we've interpreted it. But you know how in the movie sometimes you're proved wrong at the end of the last reel? That's my argument today. I think it's about more than that. I think it's about something deeper than that. I think that's just the low-hanging fruit. And I think this text has a word for us today that moves far beyond and much deeper than just mere Christian triumphalism. So, so what does the text say? The first set of workers are promised the daily wage a denarii. It has to be paid at the end of the day, according to Jewish law, because although it's a daily wage, it's the daily wage for people that are not earning a lot of money. It's, it's kind of subsistence daily wage. And so, you can't afford to wait to the end of the week, let alone the end of the month. You get paid daily because it's part of your daily bread. One denarii. Um, the next lot hired are promised only what, that what they receive will be just. And the subsequent hirers just have to take the master at his word. There, there is no promise of anything. But notice how everyone is included. You know, the first folks hired are probably the strongest, fittest, best-looking bunch. You know, you're standing there in the marketplace, and there are street corners all over America where this hiring practice is alive and kicking right up to the present day. 
So the owner looks around, and it's kind of like when you're back in high school and picking a team. You pick the strongest and the best for your side. The, the next lot of hires may have owned fields of their own. It wasn't uncommon back then to the very start of the day to work on your own field, and then when that was done, go to the marketplace to see if someone would hire you for the rest of the day so that your own subsistence plot was taken care of, and now you can earn a, a buck or so. By the time you get to the end of the day, five o'clock, um, you're kind of down to the dregs. Remember in high school? I've got to confess, you're probably not shocked by this at all. I was always one of the last kids picked. You know, I'm built for comfort, not speed. You know? so, so I was always one of the ones picked last, if at all. So I'm one of the five o'clock hires. By the time you get to five o'clock in the afternoon, it's getting close to dark. But there's still work to be done. It's that last push before the day ends when the light fa fails and all work has to come to an end. So another way of looking at this text is that everyone is included. The fittest and the strongest and the good looking all the way down to Ken Blythe all the way down to the folks that aren't normally called on, aren't normally hired, aren't, all, aren't normally included, the sort of folks that you wouldn't give a second thought to hiring for hard physical labor, but everyone is in that field. See, that's not triumphalism with the implicit part of triumphalism that means we're included and you're excluded. The opposite is the case. This is a gospel story about inclusion, about everyone being involved, or in the old seafaring phrase, all hands to the pump. What else is going on? There's a whole lot of trust being shown here. I alluded to that a minute ago. Let me make it explicit. There's a promise to the first lot. They're operating on the trust that what they've been promised is what they'll receive. And when they get it, they complain because of the evil eye. That's the little, literal translation of the original Greek when at the end of the story, the Landover says, are, are you saying this out of jealousy? Does your eye cause you to be jealous? The actual biblical text is, is it your evil eye that causes you to say this? Are you just jealous because others are included? Are you just jealous because this isn't an exclusive little group? Are you just upset that God loves everyone? Uh, really, is that, what you, is that the hill you're going to die on? Is that where you're going to take your last stand? Is that where you're going to stomp your little foot and say this isn't fair because God loves everyone? Even people that don't look like us? And everyone else places trust in the owner of the vineyard, which incidentally is a quote from Isaiah, where God is explicitly declared to be the owner of the vineyard. They just place their trust in the generosity of the landowner. And although we are focused, because that's what human beings do. Although we are focused on the angry crowd of first called, how about we focus instead not on their anger, displeasure, and jealousy, but it's not explicitly described in the text, but imagine the joy of the people hired at five o'clock who receive a full day's wage Imagine how overjoyed they are, having been left out and excluded so much, are now not only included as mere tokenism, you know, look how generous I am kind of thing, or okay, we'll let you play for the last 10 minutes. We're already ahead. What damage can you do? What can it hurt? But they are included so fully and so profoundly that they receive the same day's wage as all the rest, even down to the first. 
And then I know that this is a text where the, the, the temptation is to say, it's all about grace. It's all about mercy. And by George, it's a lot about grace and mercy. But there's justice in it too. The landowner rightly says, hold on a minute. It's my money. I, I can do with it what I want. I mean, I'm not frittering it away on killing the fatted calf for no good reason. This isn't a, a happening of drink and debauchery. I'm using this money for good, and it's mine. So why are you complaining? That has a lot to do with the social order of Jesus' day, the whole patron and client relationship. But even leaving that sort of unique, ancient kind of way of doing business to one side, the landowner can be generous if the landover want, landowner wants to be generous. And all the promises that were made are promises that are kept. So this isn't a story of grace and mercy overriding justice. This is a story where justice and mercy walk hand in hand. So that produces a tension, doesn't it? Because we are black and white people, aren't we? I mean, don't bother me about gray. I don't want to know about gray. I think this is right, so that must be wrong, and there's nothing in between. Well, in this text, justice and mercy are what scholars call held in tension. They're both true at the same time. And there's a bit of give and take, a tug and pull between the two. We see that in Paul's writing. Have you ever read Paul and said, you know, it sounds like Paul is saying now, not yet. The kingdom is here now, but it's not fully here yet. The end is starting now, but it hasn't ended completely yet. It runs all the way through Paul's writings. Now, not yet. How about Martin Luther, who declared we are simul justus et peccator, that we are at one and the same time saint and sinner. How's that for tension? We live in that tension every moment of every day of our lives as we look in the mirror and see saint and sinner staring back at us. So we're pretty good at living in that tension. Sometimes we're not. Sometimes it bothers us. It bothered Jonah. Oh, did it bother Jonah big time. I mean, some of Jonah's best zingers are left out of this text. You really got to go back and read the whole story. Remember, he's told, go to, ta go to Nineveh and tell them to repent. And N Jonah says, no. He says more than just no. He, he, no, no way. I'm going to do it. They're going to hate me. It's going to take half my life to accomplish this task. And at the end of it, you're just going to forgive them anyway. By the end of the story, Jonah is sulking under the shade of the, the little tree, and when the tree dies, Jonah is more concerned about his little tree than he is about all of the people in Nineveh, who, as Steve wonderfully read, are a bunch of people who don't know their left hand from the right. He should be loving them and caring for them, and he doesn't. He only grieves the loss of his little bit of shade as he sits there in the greatest act of pouting in the entire Scripture. Why is he pouting? Well, he tells us, he quotes the psalm this morning, Psalm 145, which is, incidentally, the most often quoted psalm in all of Scripture by Scripture. Other books of Scripture quote it ad nauseum, and almost always the same phrase, because Psalm 145 contains one of the greatest phrases in all of sacred Scripture. For you, Lord, are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And there is the wonderful poetic, but having the advantage of being true, statement that describes justice and mercy held in tension 
with each other, that we have a God of mercy, justice, inclusion, and love, all true at one and the same time, and summed up in those wonderful, life-giving, encouraging words, you, O Lord, are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Generous God, you make the last first and the first last. Where this gospel challenges the church, equip it for its works of service. Strengthen those who suffer for Christ. Lord, in your mercy, Sun and wind, bushes and worms, cattle and great cities. Nothing in creation is outside your concern, mighty God. In your mercy, tend to it all. Give us a spirit of generosity towards all that you have made. 
Lord, in your mercy. Where we find envy and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to places of conflict and violence. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the work of negotiators, peacekeepers, and development workers. Lord, in your mercy. Reveal yourself to all in need as you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Accompany judges and lawyers, victims of crime and those serving sentences. Give fruitful labor and a livelihood to those seeking work. Lord, in your mercy. Even beyond our expectations, you choose to give generously. Grant life, health, and courage to all who are in need, especially David Barth, Jack Bill, Lorraine Bosey, Katie Chapin, Georgia Cotta, Pastor Elward Cump, Anne Daly, Charlene Farr, Nancy Hargrove, Cal and Joanne Hawks, Wayne Keifler, Helen Koo, Denny Lowe, Wilma Lynch, Rebecca Matila, Benjamin Most, Sam Myers, Carrie Morrison, Juan Restrepo, Barbara Russell, Pastor Ray Siraka, Mary Ellen Chu, Diane Snyder, Josette Stubbe, and Barbara Teller. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you for the generations that have declared your power to us, especially Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Janine Johnson, Mary Miller, and Betty Suarez. Give us faithfulness to follow them, living for Christ, until your call us to join them in the joyful song around his throne. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. The heartfelt thanks of all at St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church go to you, dear friends, for the generous gifts that you have made at the bas in the baskets, either coming into or leaving worship this day. And our thanks also to those who join us at home all over this country and who have given online to further the ministry of this congregation. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare for us your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please stand. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink you all of this, 
For this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Wherefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, we now obey your Son's command. We recall his blessed passion and precious death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and we look for his coming again with power and great glory. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet where Christ gives himself as food and as drink. Please be seated.
Please stand. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Christ is with you.